This conference will now be recorded. And I wanted to, to start out by thanking you for joining us today. I have a whole bunch of questions prepared and I'm sure our audience will have some as well. Um, and I understand you're joining us from the company headquarters there in Middleburg Heights, Ohio. I presume your weather doesn't look quite like it does in this lovely photo. Being no. winter as it is. A little different, but not not uh, not as a uh, not as much as uh, snow on the ground as up north in the Sioux, and and uh, it's, it's a lovely day. So it's great to be here. Um, great to be a part with the the Army Corps of Visitor Centers. Um, you guys do a great job, and it's great to to uh, to be able to join you today. So thanks. Well, thank you. Um, I'll get started. Uh, I understand Interlake is a family owned and led company and has been for some time. I believe this is a photo of the Barker and Tregurtha families um, all assembled there together. And I was wanting to find out um, what is your earliest memory related to ships or the company? Um, I, I, so that is, you're correct, that is the, um, our Barker to grow the family, we, we do meet annually the, the entire uh, sec, first, second, and third generations. Um, and this is one of the pictures uh, in Cleveland, actually, uh, of us on a boat uh, showing everyone what we do. And um, so um, it, the, the Barker and Tregurthas go way back uh, before I was born. My dad and Paul actually went to business school together. And, um, and, and so I, you know, truthfully grown up in this business. So um, there's photos of me, I think, um, before I can remember uh, around boats, but one of my earliest memories uh, must have been in the late 70s, um, where I don't really remember the boat trip uh, that much, um, but I was on the James R. Barker, my dad's namesake, um, and riding, and all I do remember is that the boat was shaking in the shallow waters of uh, Lake Erie in the, um, Detroit rivers and uh, I thought it was quite comical that my plate would vibrate almost off the table and I would have to bring it back to to eat it and so uh, that is a very early memory of mine um, riding on that on the James R um, and eating with with a with a boat that was uh, shaken in the shallow waters of, of Lake Erie so that's certainly a colorful one I have to say, just to share, my earliest boat-related memory was going for a boat ride with my dad and being knocked off the dock into the water. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little scarier. <laughs> but yeah, mine was a little more dramatic for a three-year-old. Um, so when did you realize that you wanted a career in the maritime field? Um, I was uh, in high school. Uh, much my, I have a 17-year-old son, so he uh, is getting ready to uh, endeavor into, into his next level of education or deciding what to do in life and i remember waking up one day um and said what am i going to do with my life I, I need to sort of figure this out high school is running coming to an end um and i just need to know what i was going to do and and so i said well i like water i like boats and i don't and i've ridden on our freighters um and i said i don't get bored at sea um and so um so i was like well that sort of says that you know i should be interested in that and so at that point, I decided to look at a career at the Maritime School. So this is me actually as a senior on, on the Empire State with uh, Chief Miller, who was with my chief and, and uh, a great role model uh, in the industry. Um, but um, so I, I said, well, I guess I'll go look at Maritime schools. So I applied to a, a few Maritime schools. My dad actually took me to a bunch of other schools and said, you know, there's another life out there besides Maritime. Um, but I ended up uh, choosing SUNY Maritime, where I went and actually studied uh, studied engineering there. So and this is a photo of me in front of the Empire State, which it, which was interesting that that ship was actually uh, was a Mormac vessel, a Moore McCormick vessel, which my father was CEO of Moore McCormick Lines um, from 72 to 86. And this vessel was actually operated under that fleet. And then they repurposed it into a training ship. And so I got to sail on a ship that was actually under the operation of my father uh, when he was um, uh, when he was uh, running, running, running the more McCormick lines before Interlake. And can you tell us uh, about some of your early experiences sailing? Sure. So I, I graduated. I, I understand, as I say, and I understand from the pictures, you didn't start out on the Great Lakes. 
even though it no, was a little I, hard to get out from the shadow of your your dad's enterprises. Yeah, so I um I I I graduated from SUNY. I actually my first two jobs were actually not on ships. It was actually involved in the dry docking of tankers um, on the East Coast, one down in Tampa and one in Norfolk, uh, Virginia. Um, and then um, I wanted to sail. Um, and so I, I did sail on the Great Lakes, uh, went out in October and sailed to lay up. So got to experience um, the nice times of, of the Great Lakes. Um, then I then from there, I actually went the previous photo. So this is me on the Overstar, one of my first ships um, working uh, as a third engineer. Um, the previous photo was um, me on a Moran tug in the Gulf of Mexico um, and, and working down uh, there. So on Moran, um, a lot of, most tugboats don't have cooks. So this was actually me getting, uh, getting lunch ready or something. Uh, but we uh, sailed uh, Norfolk, uh, between Norfolk, Tampa, uh, not Norfolk, New Orleans, Tampa, and uh, Houston. And then I went down into the, into the Caribbean um, and sailed into uh, St. Croix, Haiti, Dominican Republic, and elsewhere. And then I actually got an opportunity to go back to our training ship, the Empire State, and be a watch off, training watch officer on that vessel, which was a very rewarding experience in, in teaching the next generations of mariners behind us um, at SUNY uh, at sea for their sea term. Um, and, then, and then after that, I was told to, to move to Cleveland, even though I didn't know I applied for a job in Cleveland. And so I, I, I ended up in Cleveland um, working in, uh, in the engineering department there um, shortly after uh, a, a short stint sailing in a couple different areas. Now, looking back, what were some of your favorite roles you had as you were working your way up in places where you really cut your teeth and gained valuable experience? Well, my first job in, in the maritime business uh, was spring break at SUNY Maritime. Uh, most kids go to Florida or do something else. I was shipped to Duluth, Minnesota um, and, and, uh, and to Fraser Shipyards. Um, working on the at that time what was the JL Mothy, which is now the Pathfinder, uh, carrying kerosene to keep the heaters running. So that was one of my early uh, memories of the industry and, and working in the business. Um, that does not really, sound very I, glamorous. It wasn't glamorous. It was early. <laughs> I, I learned to drink a lot of coffee at the Denny's in Superior, and um, and uh, and and uh, but it was a fun job. I, I worked with actually uh, the in the we're overhauling steam turbines, and it was very interesting. Uh, for a, brand, a sort of a new cadet type person to to be to be involved, even though I mainly was just hauling hauling heating oil. Um, but uh, but really, I've had a lot of interesting experiences. Um, the the sailing was was of course probably the most uh, the best experience from the perspective of what it's like to be at sea. Um, you know, really, our company is made up of over 400 employees, and many of them at sea, and really doing the real work of our company, keeping the ships operating, maintaining them um, throughout the season and, and our crews during the winter, getting them ready to go again in the spring. And, and having that experience, working with those uh, men and women um, and, and really having, having that memory of working on ship, I, I think has played an extremely important role in, in understanding what life aboard ship truly is it's it's uh it's something that you can say well i i can understand it but until you've actually sailed and been away um and you know in those times we didn't have satellite tv and we didn't have cell phones and and stuff like that um you know that lack of connectivity um to to your loved ones um you know it 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 it, it can be tough and so having that understanding what the job takes the the hours when when things aren't going well um, the hard work and, and the effort that has to go into keeping our vessels running and running safely. So that that was interesting. Then coming ashore and working engineering and, and working the maintenance side, dry dockings, learning, um, working with all the great shipyard people we have. The, the, for those who have been around a long time, the Larry Shimmons of Fraser Shipyard and Todd Thays and, and, um, and um, the folks at Purvis and Foster, Karen and, and her dad, Rex. Um, you know, they all taught me what it took to fix these ships, dry dock them and, and do that. So this industry is a great, incredible industry uh, made up of incredible people. And, and I, I got to experience that through, through to my 
to this day. You still get to meet new folks in this business um, in all sorts of fields, and 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 they all have great perspective and and, and uh, just bring so much to a, to a great industry. So it's been it's been a good run so far, and and looking forward to continuing and building those relationships. Now. Um we're all enamored with the the stories of sailing but what were some of the roles you had shoreside as you were working your way up to your current position um i spent a bunch of years in in the engineering department working um for uh, what we call here as a fleet engineer um, on the east coast it's sometimes known as a port engineer um but really assisting those that are running the boats um you know when they need help when you need parts outside labor doing the budgets you, 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 you really get a good understanding of what it costs to maintain these boats um, and, and how, how you put those numbers and roll up those budgets and, and plan those, those projects. Um, and so I did that for a bunch of years. At, at some point, my, I, I, I didn't really have a path, a career path ahead of me, except I was going to work in, in, the, in the maritime industry. Um, it was never, I was never told you, you will run this company someday. Um, it was never actually something that was was really um, uh, implied either one way or not. It's you you work hard, you prove yourself, and and you may get promoted is is in, as in a normal company. Um, even though I had the right last name, um, at some point my dad said, "Well, do you want to move up in this company?" I said, "I, I guess so if if you think that is a smart move." And he goes, "Well, then you better go get um, a business degree." So I, I went back to school and got an MBA from Case Western here in Cleveland. And um, then came out of that and, and pivoted from an engineering technical side um, somewhat into a bank finance side, which taught me a different part of the business that that I, I wasn't, while I was exposed to, um, I, I hadn't spent a lot of time in. And working with the bank relationships, how we manage our capital, how we invest, how do we build the models of, you know, to decide if we want to repower a ship or build a ship, or all those things, um, and so that you know really helped me balance out and understand, you know, I, I understood technically how this company runs, and then and then to help learn the financial side, and then in 2007, um, out of the blue, my dad said it's time for you to become C president of the company, and I said you sure about that, and um, and so in 2007, um, my dad. Uh, threw me in a role um, to, to sort of run run the business. Um, it was good timing on his part um, because in 2008 and 2009, we, we suffered the largest financial crisis in, in the, in, since the Great Depression. Um, so that was a really fun, fun, fun experience to, to take over and then have, have everything go down the tubes um, and figure out how we're going to unwind that. Luckily, my father is still involved in this business and is a great mentor. And, and, and we work together to, to, to get through those challenges with, with our entire team. But uh, it was definitely a, a learning lesson in, in those early days. So um, one of the questions I had prepared is if you can describe a typical day running a shipping company on the Great Lakes. Um, <laughs> I don't know if with there the is With the understanding there's day. probably no <laughs> typical day. Yeah, uh, I mean, at, at the end of the day, um, you know, in, in my current role and, and as president running this business, um, a lot of it is focused on what do we need to do to, to keep the organization healthy and, and make sure our people are, are being taken care of. And, and so while there's a lot of blocking tackling that goes on in our business, we have to order the parts, we have to make sure the maintenance, we got to make sure people get paid, we have to do that. A lot of the focus, what I have to focus on is, is how do we all come together, work as a team and, and deal with the issues of an organization um, at, at all levels and, and how, do, how do we plan? I mean, at the end of the day, our most important uh, asset is our people and, and working on that. And so while, you know, there's a lot of detail and minutia that, that I also get dragged into, um, we also got to make sure we're setting up and focusing on how we we are doing as a company to make sure we can keep retain and and um, and, and our people are operating at, at the high levels that they do. So um, it, there is no typical today. It's a lot of meetings and it bounces between internal issues and external issues. So um, um, 
So I'm working, you know, we're working on our internal issues. We're working on what's the next season look like. I'm working on government issues, regulate regulatory issues, and then our customers and working with our team and, you know, what do our customers need? What are their demands? Um, and how are we going to make sure we do that all in the context that, in, uh, of the whole organization? So it, it's a lot of different things and you run around a little bit with your head cut off. But again, as I said many times, uh, we have a great team and, and they keep it all straight and narrow and, and keep it running. So. And you may have already kind of alluded to my follow up question, which is what's the most rewarding part? What's the part that makes you feel like you made the right life choices in your career? I think it's, it's um, at, at the end of the day, I think it's the success of the business, but it's when you, you know, when you spend time with our folks and, and, and also our, our, um, our, our external folks that we service, our, our customers. So we have internal and external customers, right? So, you know, I just had lunch with a bunch of our captains that are in town for, for some meetings. Um, and, and just sitting down with them and talking about how the season went, what are the issues, um, and, and talk about how we're going to fix them and resolve those issues, how we're going to face the challenges, um, and, and be able to have that conversations with your with your teams um, is is you walk away energized, you walk away excited. They're not always easy challenges, and they're not always easily solvable challenges, but when you can sit down with with your folks and and, and even some of your outside customers and say, here's a challenge, here's a problem. How are we going to solve it? How are we going to fix that? And then, and then you get to work on it and, and then, and eventually you hopefully make progress on it and solve it. But, you know, at the end of the day, that's, that's fun. And, and that would make, you know, keeps you energized and, and, and keeps you going. So I, I can tell you that we, we, we go out to our ships and we talk to our crews and, and uh, I, I get busy. So I don't, get out as much as I, I like. But at the end of the day, when, when you're talking to everyone and figuring out how we're going to keep it running and you see these very complex assets, these ships running and, and everything that has to go into it, um, it's really cool. But at the end of the day, what we do in this industry at all levels is, is pretty cool stuff and it's fun. It, it is definitely a lot of moving parts, both onshore and off. So uh, another question that I had, you're the second generation, you followed in your father's footsteps. Um, do you think your children might follow in your footsteps? Well, or, And what or, advice uh, do you have for them? Well, one is um, they should do what makes them happy and, and um, they, should, they should follow whatever dreams they have in, in that. Um, so in this picture, um, we are, this is my blended family. So the two boys are, are mine and, and Megan and, and her two kids. Um, and, um, and, and at the end of the day, when I talk with, with my boys, um, you know, and as I have a son who's looking at colleges and what he may do next, and he is interested in maritime. He, he likes it. Uh, he likes engineering. Um, but at the end of the day, they should do what's right. I mean, we're in a family business. There is absolutely no pressure to join this business, be in this business. Um, at the end of the day, in life, you should do um, what rewards you and and um, and what makes you happy, and and follow those dreams. And and we're supportive. Um, the problem in growing up in a family business is pretty much that's all you talk about. Uh, I don't have, you know, I, I I'm not too exciting to talk to outside the shipping business. So um, so they get to hear a lot about boats and a lot about what I'm doing and and the challenges, what's going on. And so they, they're exposed to it a little bit. So, but uh, we'll see where it goes. I, I know my oldest uh, is, is intrigued by at least getting an education in, in, in the maritime side. Um, I got to go take him as my father did to a lot of other non-maritime schools and <laughs> make sure he knows there's other parts of life out there. And, uh, and we'll see where that where that ends up. We do have a, a large generation of G3s, so third generations, um, uh, with my brother, my sister, and uh, and then some of the Tagurtha uh, children. Um, there's 13 of them in, in total. Um, and so um, we do have some third generation already in the business, so. Very cool. And that sounds like excellent advice. <laughs> now, most of our, um, regular audience is pretty familiar with Interlake Steamship Company. 
but in the past few years, your company has expanded. And can you tell us about some of these other businesses that Interlake Maritime Services has taken on? Yeah, I, I'll talk about it. Um, I, I'll actually back up a little bit because people may not know this. Well, you can go to this slide and then I'll, I'll talk okay. about it. Um, there's actually a slide above this that we didn't talk about in that the Barker Tergertha family actually has 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 um, several maritime companies. Um, so we have Moran Towing uh, in the East Coast, which is a large hug boat company. We have a high speed ferry boat business in New York um, that moves passengers. And then I run Interlake Steamship. All these companies operate on their own and, and the only commonality between them, well, two, one's their maritime and two, um, they're owned by the same family group. But um, so I, I run our Great Lakes operation, which is um, technically Interlake Holding Company, but we operate now under the name of Interlake Maritime Services, which is a name we changed to um, just a few years ago when we acquired uh, the Lake Michigan Car Ferry, otherwise known as the SS Badger. Um, and then the Pier Marquette, which we um, changed its name, the, the company's name to uh, Interlake Logistics Solutions, um, and port services is the, the dock that we uh, move stone across in, in Ludington as well. Um, and then we acquired Sioux Maritime Services, which is uh, under that is the Sioux Lock Tours. Um, at the end of the day, we are, we're, we're really a maritime uh, company. Um, what we do well, I think, is we operate boats um, in, in a safe and uh, efficient manner. And so at the end of the day, our we really, I think, sometimes got pigeonholed at the Interlake Steamship level that we run sort of steamboats, right? Or traditionally was steamboats, um, self unloading bulk uh, carriers. But really, at the end of the day, I think we can run all sorts of assets. Um, and so we had the opportunity to acquire the Badger and the Pier Marquette. Um, the Badger is just an iconic vessel that serves the ports of Ludington and Manitowoc. Um, really plays an important role in their economies. Um, and in that boat, it's just incredible how many people that boat has touched in its life. Um, and we're, we're excited about the work we're doing on that boat um, and, 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 and getting it spruced up um, and continuing and figuring out how to continue to ensure it runs for, for a long, long time. It, it is run, it's in its 70th year this year. So it's an exciting year for that boat. Wow. The Pier Marquette's just a workhorse. Um, you know, I, I guess it's what happens when an old car ferry gets repurposed. Um, but really, what a unique asset um, in the lakes in that it can self-load, unload, and do so many different things that we traditionally cannot do uh, in our in our Interlake Steamship assets. So we're really, I think, that boat complements our, our bulk moves, um, but it adds a new dimension that we're excited about, and uh, it really has played a nice role. Sioux Maritime Services is a little, um, uh, again, a, a, a different shot. It, the Badger and the Sioux are passengers, um, but really plays an important role in Sioux St. Marie, uh, where you are. And um, in, in showing people and getting people out on the water, I think um, to see the boats, see the Sioux locks and the important infrastructure that plays such a role for our economy and the nation. Um, and so we're, we're thrilled with our team up there and, and Again, we're doing a lot of good work up there, sprucing that place up, and and we welcome everyone to come up and and uh, take a ride this summer with us um, and go out and sort of almost touch the freighters as as you get to lock through with them uh, and see the the great uh, town of Sault Ste. Marie. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, we now have two vessels that can give you an on water experience. Um, the Badger is so unique in that it's really the only boat you can get on, except for the cruise ships now, um, where you can really get a feel for what it's like to be on a freighter out in the middle of a lake, away from land, um, and, and sort of get that same experience on the Great Lakes. And and the and uh, but we're we're thrilled. Um, we're continuing to look at opportunities um, where where they make sense for us um, and and to su support our business of really just maritime on the Great Lakes. Well, I have to, to share just very briefly that the Badger actually was an important part of my family as well years ago. Um, I lived in Manitowoc and my ex-husband lived near Ludington. And so for my son during the, the navigation season, that was the, the easiest way and, and 
most convenient way for him to get to dad's house and mom's house. So we oh, would he- drop him off at the Badger. He'd ride across. He was an absolute, you know, boat geek at the time and talked to everybody, <laughs> asked questions, explored, got to see behind the scenes things by making friends with people. So I, I know that's just one of millions of stories probably associated with the Badger. That's yeah, great. We're we're doing um we we've actually the the two cities have started a rival. Um and so we're 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 working with the school systems and we move the kids back and forth so they can play each other in sports. So it's another neat way to connect the city. So it, it, it it's sure a great is. boat. We're, it's a, I, I truly didn't appreciate that vessel until we, we operated it and really got to understand it and, and uh, really hear from everyone just what a critical role those those ferries have played in, in, in uh, both in Wisconsin and Michigan. And now just to back up uh, for just a minute, I, I understand that you have a sentimental attachment to Sault Ste. Marie and those Sioux Locks boat tours. Can you tell us a little bit of that history? Sure, my my father, um, my grandmother was born and raised in the Sioux and uh, my dad had 13 cousins from Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. And so uh, one of my other early memories of life in boats is Sault Ste. Marie. I used to go up there often. My grandmother is actually buried in Sault Ste. Marie. And so, uh, so I, I do uh, get back there to, to visit her. She was an important woman in my life. Um, and, and, uh, and my dad not only uh, spent his summers there and actually during, during part of the depression, um, he, he uh, lived there, but, um, and, and, um, but then he actually, when he went into the Coast Guard, um, he put in for a lot of nice places um, and they stationed him at Sault Ste. Marie. So him and my mother as newlyweds lived in the Sioux. Um, and he got, he did a, a, a chunk of his Coast Guard career in the Sioux, uh, actually while they were building Rock Cut. His, uh, the Coast Guard was in charge of moving the blasting caps for the Army Corps down to, to Rock Cut to, to, uh, to deepen that channel. So, and, and from the Coast Guard, he, he, that experience he, in, in going on, he was able, he actually just got awarded um, from the, the uh, Navy Memorial, which represents all the sea services, um, of the Lone Sailor Award, which is quite quite an impressive award. Uh, one that is well, he's well deserved of, um, but it, 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 a lot of that came from the experiences and and um, and uh, in, in, in the lessons he learned in the Coast Guard at Sault Ste. Marie. Very cool. So, um, Moving on, uh, one of the most exciting developments for boat watchers like myself around the Great Lakes has been seeing the first new freighter built on the Great Lakes in about 40 years. What led you to take on construction of a brand new ship? Uh, this this was a project uh, that took a lot of years. It's pretty exciting for us um, and our and our entire company. Um, uh, we were approached by a customer that said, "Will you willing to do?" move some cargo for us and and um we said yeah but really what makes sense for us is to actually we need to build you a vessel um to make sure that we have the right asset for the right move um and so they uh they said thanks and they actually left our office and then two years later they came back and said do you want to move some cargo for us and we said yes our, our story hasn't changed um but really to do it right and they said well what would that look like and, and what does that mean in sort of economic, mainly economically? So we went to work in house and, and we have uh, we have some design folks on staff. Uh, I think that's something that uh, gives us uh, some ability to do design work on projects um, quickly. Um, and, and we actually, this vessel is designed by a gentleman who just retired, Ian Sharp, um, who worked for us for many years and, and um, this design literally came off his desk in a, on a piece of paper with, with, with his pencil drawing. Um, and from there, uh, we put it in a conceptual drawing and we presented it to the customer. And, um, and we ran the economics on it and, and they, they, uh, they agreed that this is a good move to move forward. So with their support, uh, which is Cargill Salt, um, and, and, um, and in our work, we, we launched on an endeavor to, build the first new freighter in over uh, 35 years. Um, and uh, it was quite a process. It, 
it was no easy task for sure. But it's <laughs> it's exciting and and um, and we're glad that we have it out there and, and running. So it's it's uh, we're we're still getting the kinks out of it, but we're we were thrilled with the first year on it, and uh, we put had a great team running it and uh, a lot of new things that we had to learn to do, um, and and we're 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 making great progress. Now, um, the slide we have up right now, I understand depending on how people are watching, it's got a, it might be a little hard to read all of that text. So I was gonna take a minute to let people know that there are fact sheets on the Mark W. Barker and all of the Interlake steamship vessels. And uh, Scott will be posting a link to those in the chat for anyone who wants to check out those fact sheets. And uh, I had a, a question here. Uh, technology's changed a lot since you built the Paul R. Tregurtha in the 1980s. What are some of the cutting edge features that are built into the Mark W. Barker? Um, yeah, I mean, ships are ships. So at the end of the day, you, you can make them different looking. But at the end of the day, the principles of design of shipping um, haven't changed that much. I think the materials, um, you know, the materials in, in the computer technology that goes into design has been able to change um, how we build the structure. So, you know, making at the end of the day, a ship is designed to carry cargo and building that structure as strong as possible with the least amount of weight is, is critical. Um, so we did that and we optimized it to carry. Um, it has tier four engines, which I think we're the first E, tier four EMD engines and, and actually in a ship and I think in the United States, not the world. Um, and so we, we have some of the computer tech, some of the environmental technologies as best we could um, that the hull form in the back um, with the propeller and the rudder um, allows again, looking at total efficiency. Um, we then did a little change of, of hull design as far as the cargo hold goes. As you can see in these pictures, that they're it's a big square cargo hold very different than than our traditional self unloaders and we do have the unloading system which is the great system you see in the middle um and and we did a little different structurally um no, normally self unloaders have arches which support uh the ship transversely across the top of the cargo holds and here you see we have a couple large um structural members that that keep that transverse strength um, and that allows us to have a very large um, ocean, uh, very large opening of hatches, um, which here you can see is, is not actually being used to load steel, which was a, a unique move in the Great Lakes um, that we were excited about. But um, we do have to change the unloading of, of the vessel. So we have some front loaders in, in, in the vessel to move the cargo to the conveyor when we move traditional bulk cargoes. Um, but we have large openings um, that allow us to be a little more flexible in what we do and, and how we do it. The hatches are, are common on ocean ships, the McGregor hatch, um, but we are, I think, the first Laker to have a, a, a McGregor hatch, which is a, is a change of, of mindset of design, um, and, and uh, we're working. So it, it allows us to have these large openings. Um, now, you know, for, I think for those of us who are not engineers, um, what is the difference between a standard hatch cover and a McGregor hatch cover? Well, um, well, one, um, the the McGregor, so the, the McGregor hatch covers are larger. They're quite heavy, actually. I think they're about 40 some tons, um, and and um, they're actually load bearing. So you can actually, we could um, put cargo on top of the vessel, like like project cargo a wind tower or a container or you know piece of equipment or something um the, the traditional laker hatches as we all see in in photos of traditional lakers are kind of long skinny hatches there's lots of them they're they're lined up to load chute docks so that that they're lined uh, at like marquette or such they're designed to accept chute loads for iron ore um and so you have to move the boat from hatch to hatch um, and it's really a small opening designed specifically in how we've done cargo for our, over 100 years in the Great Lakes, and that's gravity feed bulk material into ships. This vessel does that as well, but with the larger openings uh, of the McGregor hatches, it also allows us to be able to lift equipment in and out 
um, steel and, and those things. So it gives us a bigger access than traditional. It, it, they're heavier hatches, the McGregor. They're stronger hatches from structural perspective um, when you look at loads, but, and there's less of them. We only have five hatches um, versus in some cases, I, I, I should know this off the top of my head, but you know, tens and tens and 80, 80 hatches on a, on a normal ship. And uh, for years, I've heard people commenting that there should be a Mark W. Barker boat. And I wanted to find out what is it like to have a ship named after you? Yeah, I, I don't agree with it. There should be one. Um, but I have a, my father is 87 years old, still in this business and said, we're going to name this boat after you. And at some point I lost the argument. Um, but it's humbling. It's uh, it's uh, it's kind of weird. It does confuse some communications and mail in the office, um, depending on where where mail is coming to me or the vessel. But um, but it's it's humbling. I mean, at the, at the end of the day, you know, this boat really re represents the incredible work all of our employees do to make this company successful. Um, and it's a little weird to have your name on it, like I'm the one that did it. Um, so. But it, it is, it is uh, it's truly an honor. I, I, I won't argue that. And, uh, and it's pretty cool. So, but it's, <laughs> it really, at the end of the day, this, this vessel um, is really a representation of all our great people. And uh, I had a little note here. Um, in the 1970s and 80s, there was a huge push to build footers. Uh, the, the queen of the lakes, the biggest of them all being your own Paul R. Chagurtha. But Interlake also owns and operates some of the smaller vessels on the Great Lakes, like the Mark W. Barker now and the Herbert C. Jackson. And I have to say, from a Sioux Locks perspective, working in the visitor center in the park, we love when we see that the Herbert C. Jackson is coming through the locks. It's one of the few freighters that fits in the MacArthur lock and lets people get a really up close experience uh, with these great freighters. But I wanted to find out what are some of the advantages of these smaller vessels? I mean, at the end of the day, we, you need a, a wide variety of vessels to service all of our customers. Um, you know, the, the footers are amazing boats, uh, move incredible amounts of cargo, but they're limited to where they can go, right? So they can load in Duluth, they can load to Harbor, Silver Bay, um, and they can go to Chicago, you know, Indiana Harbor, Burns Harbor, Gary, um, and Cleveland, Toledo, Detroit. But um, But there's a lot of ports. The Great Lakes is an immense connected system. Um, with a lot of small ports, the ports of Holland and and um, uh, up the Detroit River, Rouge River, um, Fairport, you know, all sorts, even parts of the Toledo River, um, or the Maumee. Um, so we really, at the end of the day, we, we need to be able to service all of our customers, no matter where they are. And to do that, you need a diverse fleet that is able to do that. In, in some cases, it's a small boat. In the case of the MWB, what we're thrilled about, it's a forward boom to be able to reach a spot that our aft booms can't reach. Um, in some cases, it's the Pier Marquette who can get in almost anywhere um, and, and do things. So at the end of the day, it, it's, it's important to have this flexibility. At the end, we need to get as much cargo as possible per trip into our customers to be cost effective, but at the same time, we need the vessels that can also fit their docks. And, and so we have really have a, a great fleet, you know, the Pathfinder from a Z drive maneuverability, um, able to really quickly transit the Cuyahoga river, um, to, to, you know, to the other vessels. So. Now under your leadership, in addition to building a new freighter, uh, Interlake's undertaken some huge projects, repowering vessels and installing scrubbers. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about these investments in the fleet and explain uh, the advantages? Sure. So, um, you know, I think uh, as, as we all look, um, the blessing and the curse of the Great Lakes is fresh water. Um, we, we have great fresh water, which um, the good news is it doesn't rot ships. Um, our, uh, you know, there's chips on the Great Lakes. Um, the, uh, the, um, um, I'm facing the name, the St. Mary's Challenger. Sorry, I was just having a brain <laughs> spasm there. Um, St. Mary's Challenger was built before the Titanic and, and the actual hull of that vessel is still operating today. But when they when they when before they turned it into a barge, it ran for over 100 years on the Great Lakes. Um, that's just an amazing testament to, to the Great Lakes. Um, and, and, um, and so we as well have vessels 
that were built in the 50s, in some cases the 40s. Um, and, and while the halls are in great shape, um, at some point the engines do get tired, the equipment gets tired. Um, at the same time, as we all are aware, there's a push to decarbonize and reduce our footprints um, and emission footprints. Um, and so we have working hard to lead the charge on how do we do that and, and how do we incrementally uh, improve um, our operation of the vessel, not only from a safety perspective, a reliability perspective for our customers, um, but also from an environmental perspective. And so we uh, started with the Leach Gertha in 2006, which seems like the other day, it was over 16, 17 years ago now. And, and, um, and we went through and did the Lee and the Oberstar, um, and then re actually repowered the Paul R. Tegertha, which is um, and, and, and uh, changed out her engines. Um, and then at the same time we are looking at that, um, the emission control area came into play, which is which a limit on sulfur emissions on, of, of vessels. Um, and and um, so we looked at that hard. We actually looked at using liquefied natural gas as a fuel. Um, we were very close to actually starting to convert this fleet to li liquefied natural gas. Um, that didn't pan out at the end, and, and, and uh, we pivoted and actually went to exhaust gas scrubbers, which you see in this photo being lifted into one of the ships, um, which actually removes the sulfur, but also removes particulate matter out of our, our exhaust system. And so we're, we're actually below the limits of ECA um, the emission control area as far as sulfur and emissions by actually cleaning our exhaust as, as we burn. Um, and then th we went on an extensive repowering. Um, all our repowers were dual engine repowers, even though on steamships, in this case, the K here, you see, um, we actually had to remove part of the stern um, to fit the new propeller um, and, 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 and properly have it aligned. Um, so that was a little bigger, um, cutting off the, the, the um, part of our stern, but we went with twin engine to single output. So all our ships are having redundancy in propulsion motors, um, in which we did for safety and reliability reasons. Um, but it was a very successful um, uh, pro project. Uh, we put an immense amount of automation on these ships um, to help ensure the safety and operation of these vessels as well. And again, uh, some of these slides they have a lot of stats, and these are all <laughs> available on Interlake Maritime EGS. Services website. <laughs> EGS is exhaust gas scrubbers, so for for anyone's information. So, but you know, at one point we were probably one of the larger steam fleets in the in the Great Lakes, and today we're we we uh, while we did all that great work, we went and bought the Badger, so we went and bought a coal-fired steamboat. So that's our <laughs> remaining steamboat today. Um, but, you know, we really, that repowering process transformed our fleet and not only did it clean up emissions, reduce fuel consumption and all those things, um, it also um, allowed the ships be to be actually become more maneuverable by having controllable pitch propellers and allowing us to have diesel engines where we could back for long periods of times. So it really changed the dynamic our, as our, of our fleet as well as the operating uh, and safety profile of our fleet. Now, um, I recently learned that Interlake Steamship Company was the first U.S. Great Lakes fleet to join Green Marine in 2017. And could you tell us a little bit about this program and your role in it? Sure. So Green Marine is an organization of ship operators um, uh, and actually ports um, in that we, um, the organization sends voluntary benchmarks to achieve um, above and beyond regulations uh, of environmental uh, initiatives. So it has several, I, I won't go into all of them because I'll probably get some of them wrong, but um, we, we were the first US fleet to join Green Marine, um, proud of it, um, but we have to do uh, an audit every year um, in which we, they, they come in, look at what we're doing and how do we rate on that scale of, of um, from one to five on how we're doing. Um, that is a public document. And, um, and, and so it really shows what we're trying to achieve, where we need to achieve, um, in, in what areas we're working on. Um, it's a great uh, operation. There's many of the ports are into it as well. 
um, and there's more and more U.S. carriers joining. Um, but really, it, it, shipping is already the greenest form of transportation on a per ton basis. So we're able to move, you know, one of our thousand footers can move one ton of cargo 600 miles on one ton, one, one gallon of fuel. Um, no one else can really beat that, but we can still do things to improve our operations and lower our footprint and ensure that we're moving, helping move um, America's supply chain efficiently and safely. And in by maritime, you know, you don't have to wait for us at a railroad crossing. You, you, you don't have to worry about us on a highway next to a truck. We come in and deliver um, literally 700 train cars and material into Cleveland within eight hours and no one knows we even were the, existed. So, but Green Marine is a way to, to measure what you're doing and figure out how you need to continually improve that. So we're proud to be a part of Green Marine. I'm actually, I sit on the US board of Green Marine as well. And then we've just joined another coalition called the Blue Sky Initiative, Maritime uh, 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 Initiative, in which is trying to work together as in complete industry of how do we decarbonize the maritime sector. So that's a, a, an ambitious goal. Um, and really what we've decided as an industry that it can't be solved by one or two people. It needs to be solved collectively. And, and we're proud to be working on with that organization as well. Well, that sounds like some great uh, directions to move, not just for Interlake Steamship, but for all of us who live here on the Great Lakes. Drink the water and breathe the air. Um, those of us that watch boat traffic for pleasure or for work, like myself, we noticed that uh, a lot of Interlake steamship vessels stop around detour twice a year. Uh, I understand that's for company meetings. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, this is a photo of my dad and I um, going out to see a boat. Um, it started in 1987. My dad took Interlake private in 1987 and said, we got to go talk talk to our, to our, to our boats and, and find out what's going on. And it's something my dad until just recently did twice a year since 1987. That was a lot of visits for him. Um, <laughs> and we go out, we bring um, parts of our management team, depending on the issues and what we want to address. And we uh, go out to our vessels um, and we hold meetings with them. Um, we share company financials, um, talk about the issues of the day. And most importantly, we get to hear about the issues of the day. Um, with everyone in the crew. Um, it's an incredible um, time to get feedback and, and understand. It's very easy to sit here in my desk all day and say, I know what's going on in the world. Um, that's absolutely false. The only really way to find out what's going on in the world is go out and, and hear it. And so it's an incredibly, one of our, one of, it's one of our mechanisms for feedback, but one of our most important that uh, my father started many, many years ago and we will continue as we go forward. So it's getting a little harder as we add boats, but we're, we'll still <laughs> figure it out. So I have a, I was wondering in your experience, both you know on shore running the company and having been a sailor yourself, uh, what makes a successful sailor? I think it, 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 it's no different than anything in life. It's it's hard work, dedication, and and respect respect of your your shipmates and respect, you know, just um, respect. So, I mean, at the end of the day, um, you, you know, it's it's really, you know, going forward and 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 putting a good effort in and 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 doing it in a way um, as a team um, and and you know, be able to work with those around you and, and be respectful of those. Um, it, it is not an easy life. It's a tough life. You're away from home. Um, but it's that part's getting easier as we have cell phone connections and satellite TVs and soon we'll have high speed Internet um, uh, this year. So we're excited about that. And um, and so that connectivity is better. But it's it's really about, you know, looking out for yourself, but looking out for your shipmates and then really being a problem solver and, and doing good work. So now um, if any members of our audience or their friends or family are interested in working on your ships or a career in the industry, uh, how should they get started? Uh, call us and we'll get you work. So, um, <laughs> but, um, so, you know, I think if you want 
if you just want to get out in the boats and work sort of entry level i mean the, the the neat thing about this industry it's still an industry where you can go out as a deckhand and work your way up to captain and we have many captains or chiefs that have done that um and and we help along the way um and but you know if if, if so if you want to just get out and start working um it there's some effort to be done to do that that's one of the barriers of our industry is that you have to get a merchant mariner credential um, and so you have to apply to Coast Guard to get a card and work. We're working with them right now to see if we can get that. Usually it takes about 90 days or more, uh, or sometimes three to six months to get that card just so you can get out working. To us, that's, that's an, a barrier. Um, and so we're working to see if they can actually give an issue a temporary MMC um, while they work on your paperwork so you people can get out, start earning money. Um, and so we're hopeful that will happen this year um, uh, as we work through that process with them as an industry. But, you know, we can get you out. You have to get a drug test. We got to get a physical and 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 um, and then get through your paperwork and we'll get you out to to work. And um, if if you wanted to try to get a, a, you know, sort of an education in maritime, there's Great Lakes Maritime Academy in Traverse City, um, a great school. And then there's the other state maritimes in maine mass new york which i'm i i prefer because i'm a suny grad um <laughs> texas and california um and then we have the federal maritime kings point which if you apply and get in there you get a free education um so there's there's a bunch of different ways to do that um we have the steelworker union and our meba um on our on our cell phone loaders and the amo on the badger and the pier marquette and both those school, both unions, all those unions have ways to help you also get into into the industry as well. So, but call us up; we're happy to talk, and we have a great team uh, here in Cleveland that in at the Badger at the Sioux as well. So, if you if you got a hundred tonner, we can put you to work in the Sioux. If if you want to work on the Badger, we can get you there and during the summers. And then, of course, we can always get you to work on our on our cell phone loaders. We're all now, hiring. Um, OK, <laughs> good news. Um, we call this program Made in America. And can you tell us a little bit about what Made in America and the Jones Act means to Interlake Maritime Services and to our nation as a whole? Yeah, I think what we represent is U.S. built, U.S. owned and U.S. crew. And that's what the Jones Act is. And, and if you think about the Jones Act, um, we are an island state, if you think about it, in that most of our goods are, come to or from the, on the oceans to connect to the world, you know, except through Canada and Mexico. Um, and so along back in 1920, our, our government realized the importance of having a, merit, having a maritime industry, uh, a strong one, and, and um, put together the Jones Act to ensure that any goods moved between U.S. ports were done on U.S. ships that were U.S. built and U.S. crewed. And it's very important that we have a American shipbuilding industry that, you know, I'm very proud. You, a lot of people said, don't you want to get rid of the Jones Act? You can build your boat in China. I don't want to build my boat in China. I want to build it here um, with the workers that we have. And it's important on several levels. It's important for national security. You can look at all sorts of countries, including Canada and England, who got rid of the national build requirement and they can't build boats right now the canadians are trying to build an icebreaker they're struggling the england tried to build an aircraft carrier they struggled they almost couldn't get an aircraft carrier built and in the fact that we can build ships in the united states tugs barges ships like the mwb um, are critically important because those are skilled workers that you can't teach overnight if you ever get in a time of war and, and, and actually, the Department of Defense is, is just really woken up that we need a strong maritime um, uh, ability to support our military. In, in the Iraq war, we had U.S. Jones Act ships go there to supply our, our, our armed forces. We also chartered foreign flag boats. The interesting part of that is the foreign flag boats went to the war zone line and anchored and said they would not enter the war zone for safety. It was the US flagships that went in and took those cargoes to our troops. So you could say, yeah, you can go get it, but that doesn't mean they actually will cross the line and get the, 
the tonnage delivered. So it's super important from that perspective. It's important that we train our people. At the end of the day, our ships, we live, work, and, and play in the Great Lakes. We do the same in the Mississippi River. We do it along the East Coast. And it's important that those ships that ply and those tug barges and, and all those us assets that ply those waters are, are moving goods with our own people and, and, and ensuring that we can get that stuff moved safely, environmentally you know, conscious so that we're not having violations and polluting these great waters um, in, in doing that. So the, the Jones Act plays such a critical role. Um, we build in America. I, I, I can see some of the comments that said, here it goes, this is no longer made in America. Unfortunately, because our Jones Act fleet has shrunk because of lack of support from government policies saying it's better to sh have foreign owned, we do not build everything you need to build in the US to build a ship. So some of our components, yes, are built overseas. That is not because we chose to, it's because you can't buy them in the United States. Uh, on, on a commercially viable basis. Um, so yeah, are there are components in our ships that are, are not completely US? Absolutely. I can tell you everything that we can source is sourced from the US as much as possible because I can tell you when we started repowering ships, some of those components were foreign. Boy, was it a pain in the butt when they broke. And so we purposely get as much as we can. Our gearbox was built in Texas. Our engines were built in Illinois. You know, our steel was built and made in Burns Harbor for the most part. Um, and so what we can do and what we can buy um, is, is really important. And in the new ship, that really shows that. It was iron ore mined in Minnesota, shipped on US freighters, built in the US to Burns Harbor, where it was made into plate by cliffs, shipped back to Sturgeon Bay, to create a ship to do it again. And, and you can't get more built in America than that. There's critics out there that say, oh yeah, but you're doing this and doing that. At the end of the day, we are not a Chinese built Laker. We are not what CSL or Algoma has, no offense to them, I like those guys, but our ships were made here, built by us and, 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 uh, and, and we're proud of that. And I think it's something we are. There is a program out there called Voices of Maritime done by the American Maritime Partnership, which is what defends the Jones Act. And if you look up, go to American Maritime Partnership, you can sign up for Voices of America and you'll get newsletters and updates on those that are attacking the Jones Act. Um, and and there's, there's many of our own people in the government that attack the Jones Act on a regular basis. And you can sign up and you can help put your voice into protecting an important part of our nation uh, security and economic um, importance. So, so that's my Jones Act speech. <laughs> well, and thank you. It made a lot of sense to me, and that was pretty. Uh, you know, it was a pretty neat thing to think about that the steel that was used to build the Mark W. Barker probably started out as pellets on the the James R. Barker. <laughs> uh, at least on the Stuart Bay Court. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and. Um, I had a what's hopefully an easy softball question for you. Uh, as you might guess, most of our audience are pretty hardcore boat watchers, and that's a big hobby of ours is to go to various ports and watch boats. Um, what are some of your hobbies that are not related to boats? Uh, a lot of it has to do with water. Um, so <laughs> I, I, we, we, uh, I grew up racing sailboats and, and spent a lot of time on water with my family. Um, so continue to love being on the water if it's sailing, if it's actually fishing. My my youngest son is an avid fisherman. He, he gets up at 5 a.m. before school and goes out and, and fishes. Um, so uh, so we do that. He, this picture actually is uh, sea kayaking up in Alaska this summer. So we went camping and kayaking uh, up in Valdez. Um, and then, you know, uh, there's plenty. Of, I ski in the winter. So we, we spend time on the slopes and in, in, in doing such as that. Um, and the rest of it's just good old hiking, traveling. Um, if it's mainly outdoors, I'm pretty pumped to do it. And, uh, and, uh, and so, you know, all, all those activities, so. Well, thank you. Uh, that has got me to the end of my prepared questions. So I'm going to turn this back over to um, Scott. 
take me a minute to figure out how to do uh -huh. that. <laughs> Give me a second. We'll give people a, a few minutes to start typing questions into the chat. Um, I know Mark has some some uh, limited time. I'm good for now. We can go a little bit. Okay. <laughs> you let us know when you're uh, down to the last question, please. Will do. Okay, Scott, have you got it? All right, there we go. Uh, just a couple of before we get to the question and answer session here, um, a little bit on updates on how our visitor centers are doing, what we're doing for opening hours and such. Here at the Lake Superior Maritime Visitor Center in Duluth, uh, we're currently open Friday through Sunday, 10 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Uh, as of the end of the shipping season, and we will stay that way up until uh, March 25th when things start going again. Uh, for folks that are up here uh, when we might not be open, uh, there are cell phone, uh, outdoor cell phone tours that you can do. Um, there's also a virtual online tour of the visitor center if you're not able to make it during hours that we're open. And uh, there's also an online gift shop too um, if you're not able to get inside. For the Sioux Locks Visitor Center in Sault Ste. Marie, uh, the park is open 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. currently every day. Um, there are online exhibits and information sheets since uh, the visitor center is closed right now. Um, there'll be an open house there on March 25th, uh, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And the visitor center officially reopens for the summer season, uh, tourist season, May 1st, a little bit later this year. And if folks are looking to head out here before we talk about questions and such, just one last reminder about our upcoming program on March 2nd. Again, we'll be doing a program talking about the long-term layups around the Great Lakes, the vessels like the Edward L. Ryerson that have been laid up for a long time and uh, why they're we'll talk about why they're laid up, their histories. Uh, our park ranger Kaylee will be talking about that. So please join us on March 2nd for that program. All right, so let's see, Mark. I have a couple of questions here from the chat from earlier for you. Um, let's see what the first one is here. So um, Chuck in the chat here mentioned uh, late last year, the Mark Barker, while they were leaving, the captain of the Barker said, quote, for the that the Mark Barker is more for the younger guys, and he's not a younger guy, so he's going to be going back to the minor. I think that was Paul Berger that was the captain on there. Um, so Chuck wanted to know, what is it about the Mark Barker that makes it better suited for younger captains? Is it advanced electronics, more complex systems, procedures, tough river navigation? Uh, what, what do you think? Um, I won't speak for Paul, um, but I, I think we brought Paul over um from the minor um for his leadership and for for his experience um he was also captain of the dorothy and pathfinder for a long time um and and so you know we brought him over there to to really take leadership of, of the new vessel and he's done a, a phenomenal job along with his uh relief captain vince and, and the rest of the crew um you know i i think uh when you get into the smaller boats um they're working boats they do a lot of trips they're in and out of port uh, a lot. Um, they're very frequently they they they're moving with cargo in them, not empty. Um, you know, a thousand footer, you you're, you leave port and you arrive to your next destination. Next destination, besides the Sioux stop, um, you know, two two days, three days later, and you spin around and go empty up the lake. Um, so it's a little easy, I think, a little easier from a schedule perspective. But uh, I, I'll uh, defer to Paul to to, to uh, at some point um, expand on that. But I, I think it's, um, when you look at the Jackson, you look at the um, uh, the Pathfinder and, and now the MWB, um, you know, those boats are in and out of ports, uh, moving a lot of cargo. Um, the Jackson, I think, uh, moved over, you know, was just a couple, half a million or so tons short of a footer in, in cargo moved. Um, so in, in perspective, it's moving a lot of a lot of cargo uh, in the same season. So it's a lot more trips. Mm -hmm. 
I've uh, I've definitely heard. I have a couple of friends who are in the industry, and they've told me that they like, you know, being on the Jackson or wherever just because they're busy more often, going from port to port and such. And some some people don't like that either, especially if you've been in the industry for a long time. But um, another question here from Bill: um, Is there any plan for the Mark W. Barker to haul salt in the winter as the Algoma boats do? Uh, that would be based on, uh, I'm not against it. Uh, my crews might be against it. Um, <laughs> so, so, uh, but, um, you know, that it all depends on, on the customer, um, d- demands and, and what they want from us. Um, this year for sure, um, uh, we want to get the boat back in the yard. There was some things we needed to tweak and, and, uh, and so it, for this year, for sure, uh, we wanted to back sort of be able to reset some stuff and, and work on things as we learned uh from from boat running so that we can get it out next year and 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 hit the season hard so we'll see what happens that's that's a customer demand uh gotcha uh, so awesome uh let's see here other questions so there's a question in here about container shipping can you see interlake getting involved with that and all in the near future yeah i think there's um I think you've seen the port of Cleveland uh, move containers outbound with uh, with a foreign flag vessel. Um, you, we've heard the announcements of Duluth doing containers. A lot of theirs uh, is just handling containers. I think they put one vessel together and exported some some material via container this year. Um, port of Milwaukee is now a container port um, and, and has, has ability in Port of Monroe as well has has the systems in place to to handle and move containers. And I, I think the Port of Oswego has is, is gotten a grant to get some container handling equipment as well. So, you know, I think with the um, the whole supply chain issues that we've had over the past few years, it, it's folk, it's refocusing people on how do you move things and, and how do you do it efficiently? Um, and we can do that. Um, I think um, there is capability um, to do it. The new ship actually with, with the hatches we have on it can be adapted to do containers. Um, but again, traditionally, it hasn't been done domestically in the Great Lakes. Um, and so it, it's going to take a big shift of how stuff moves through the Great Lakes to, to pivot uh, into the container. At some point, we got to show some people that it's done, and that would be exciting to be able to do. And if we can do that, then and maybe containers can be developed. Um, but again, you know, it. With the advent and, and the funding that highways get and the trains get, um, uh, uh, containers have moved that way for for many 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 years. Um, so to figure out the right way to move, we got to find the right partners that are willing to help develop the trade patterns that need to happen. So we, we we're, we've talked to folks about it and we'll see where it goes. Um, and I think it would be an exciting development for the Great Lakes. Yeah, definitely. I personally, I was excited to see steel bars being uh, delivered from Monroe this year up here to Duluth Superior. It was just neat to see something uh, new happening there. And then hopefully maybe in the future we might be getting other cargoes. I don't know. Um, I thought I heard that we might get wind turbine parts at some point maybe on the Mark Barker. Has there been any talk about that? Um, There has been talk. um, and, And that again has to do with the need and, and where the turbines come from, um, but we I can I can confirm that we have uh, have laid out what it would look like to put wind tower not the not the blades but the towers uh, uh, in and in and on the vessel. So if that opportunity comes, um, we're absolutely ready to handle it. Um, that steel move was exciting, and we didn't move a whole lot of steel in relative terms of what we could, but just mm-hmm. that move one of those moves alone was 270 trucks. Um, so what wow. that it would have taken 270 trucks to move that steel from Monroe to Duluth um, if if they drove it there. And so it shows you the power of what we can do and how many trucks we can get off a road if if we can figure out how to do that. And and again, I said we 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 still had lots of capacity on that ship to carry more steel if if it was available. So. Awesome. I had no idea how many trucks I would take to, it didn't seem like a large load from pictures, but man, that's, that's a lot of uh, trucks. A lot of weight. Yeah. 
Um, so another question from someone on here. Um, Connor was wondering if Inner Lake Freighters will use Manitowoc, Wisconsin at all more in the future. I don't know what the current, how often Inner Lake uh, Freighters visit there, but can you talk about that at all? For Manitowoc? Um, yeah. Yeah. Hell, we would love to carry a cargo anywhere. Um, so uh, we're, <laughs> we're open to talking about moving anything where it makes sense. Um, we used to deliver uh, coal into there back when they, they took coal deliveries with the K Barker. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's been some Canadians in there unloading uh, grain this year. Um, and we'd absolutely look at it like that. It just it needs to make fit the right trade patterns mm -hmm. and where that cargo yeah. comes from. So we, we would absolutely welcome it. The Pier Marquette does go in there. Um, and we, we, we move uh, material in and out of Manitowoc with the Pier Marquette. So, so we, we, we do have some boats going in and out of there. It, it, again, it will just be a matter of demand and, and if we, we, we can do it for the right price. Awesome. And then um, looks like we have a couple of more questions on the new Mark Barker. One of them being, how was the crew chosen for the Mark Barker? Um, well, we picked the leadership team, uh, Captain Berger and Eric Wazo, who's the chief. And from there, we worked with them to figure out who, who they wanted and, and who wanted to come to the MWB um, to build the team to, to work through the, you know, and anytime you start up a new operation, there's challenges with that. And, and, and so, you know, we knew, wanted people that, that was ready to help face those challenges, work with them. And, and uh and and manage their way through them because they're they're they were at times could be frustrating but um you know so we we found a we found our leadership team we got great leaders throughout our entire fleet and our captains and our chiefs um and then from there they they uh picked the rest of the team from there awesome and then uh let's see we have a more technical question here um regarding the mark w barker so what i've I've been lucky. I have actually been on board. Uh, we got a little tour while we, it was up here in Duluth. And um, what's cool in the hold, people might not realize, is those small caterpillars that are in there. Um, this is a specific question about um, where they're kept on the ship, um, what they're powered by, how they're lowered into the hold, or if they just stay there. Do you know much about the caterpillar uh, pieces of equipment that live in the hold there? Yeah. So we have um, we have cat front loaders. I think they're D. Oh boy, three, three. Anyhow, I'll get the number wrong on them. I used to know them all the time. Right? But yeah. um, yeah, they're they're two front loaders. They uh, they have their own garages. They live in the boat. Um, uh, they're equipped to operate. Uh, they're they're completely uh, explosion proof uh, vessel operations. Um, and so we we have uh, maintenance garages either end of the boat uh, that they live in, and uh, and so we do all that work there. They're not designed to come in and out unless we need to for you know critical maintenance. Um, but we lifted them in in uh, the new ones. The original ones were were not actually the ones that are in there now because they were uh, we were, we actually ordered new ones. So we put the original ones in in the shipyard and then um, Midwest Terminals in Toledo assisted in putting the new ones in uh, mid 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 year. So awesome. And then let's see here. Uh, there was a quick question. Someone just wanted to know if there were any news or updates with the Badger coming up this next season. If, it, if there are any changes or anything going on there. No, I mean we're getting ready to get the season underway in May. Uh, we're excited for it. It's, again, as I said, it's our 70th year on the, the or the Badger's 70th year. Um, so a lot of work's getting done uh, inside and out. So you know um, a lot of cosmetic stuff, hallways, floors, uh, paint, uh, a lot of work in the engine room. Uh, but nothing major per se. Um, so we're 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 gonna run as normal. Um, it's our intent to run two trips a day if we can, and get back to normal schedules. Um, and uh, but we're excited about that boat. We we've, we've done a a lot of work prior year in the dry dock and this year as well. Um, and we continue to have a, a an aggressive plan long term for that vessel. So. All right, and then. Um, uh, let's see here, looking through questions quick, 
um, might need to make this the last one. So I, oh, I, okay. I'll have to get on the road. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Sounds good. Um, I guess one last question, at least for me, is what do you see in the near future for challenges for the company and what are you looking forward to also for opportunities in the future? You've talked a little bit about the different cargoes that you guys are going to be moving in the future with the new boat. Well, what kind of challenges do you guys see coming up? I, I think, you know, uh, uh, the challenges um, are for is, is will be economic challenges, uh, depending on what the economy does and how it, it runs and autos and, and coming, we're still coming out of some of the supply chain challenges. Um, but we're, that piece is kind of, figuring itself out and, and we'll, we'll adapt as that adapts as we always do. Um, Long-term, we have the environmental challenges. Um, we have everything from ballast water to um, air emissions that we continue to work on and, and develop. The Pier Marquette actually tested a ballast water system this year um, to try to better understand the challenges and, and there are plenty. Um, and, and then air emissions and really how do you decarbonize ships uh, in the future and what does that look like? What are the fuels of the future? Um, how do they work? How do they? How do you supply them? Um, and, and so there's a lot of uh, a lot of questions and unknowns there that will continue to work. Um, so and and then and then you know and then building the workforce for the future. So it, it's it's those are sort of the normal challenges and, and we're 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 already uh, tackling most of them and uh, excited to figure out. How, how we address some of those that we don't have the answers to yet. Well, awesome. Well, again, Mark, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm sure everyone enjo enjoyed watching the conversation you guys had. Um, also, um, thank you all, too, for watching the program. Uh, like I said, we recorded it, so you'll be able to find that on YouTube. And please join us again uh, next month for our next program. Great. Well, thanks for having me and everyone have a safe winter and we'll see you all in the spring when we get going underway. So thank you. Awesome. Looking forward to it.